So uh, you have watched the new movie release, The Outpost, and uh, it probably reminded you of some of your service there, and pro perhaps you were at the same post. Uh, tell me about your initial reaction when you watched this movie. What was there that you really connected to? Yeah, so a, a couple different things. So I did serve at that same outpost. Um, that was the one in Kamdesh District up in Nuristan. And I had actually read the book prior to it called The Outpost, and that's by, by Jake Tapper. And it's a, a chronological history of the, um, of the combat outpost. Keating is the name of it, named after one of the soldiers who unfortunately died in that area. And obviously, I had that personal connection with it, so I was really drawn to it. Um, it it's part of my history, part of my story. And it culminates in that final battle um, that we see played out in, in the movie, which is, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in combat. Um, I've been in very dangerous situations. I, I cannot even imagine what those soldiers went through in that battle. Um, and that was um, almost two years after I had left there uh, when that happened. It was a very dangerous location. Um, <laughs> The big one when the uh, the enemy was going to mass together, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, it did. And they lost a lot of great soldiers that day, and there was a lot of heroism. Um, as you've seen that movie as well, that was on display. Yeah, it is, I did through some reports reviewing the movie. They all talk about heroism of American soldiers there. Uh, perhaps you also had some kind of like translators along with you, right? So tell me also your experience with Afghan translators, regardless of this battle, but they're always there. What's your thoughts about these Afghan translators serving with the U.S. military, like dangerous outposts like that? Yeah, uh, I love, I'm still in touch with my interpreters. I absolutely love them. Two of them are here in the United States. They moved over here with their family. One is in Washington, one is down in Texas. And there's another one that is that's still back in Kabul right now, and I've helped write letters as he's going through the process of bringing his family. You know, they've received threats, like many um, interpreters that work with the coalition forces have, unfortunately. Um, and it's a, a difficult process. There's obviously a lot of paperwork involved, um, which is understandable too. But at the same time, too, it, it makes it really difficult on them, and it's a long process. Um, so we, we stay in touch, um, thankfully, for social media, for Facebook. Um, you know, we see these comments, we see each family grow. And so it's going to be you know, local national as our interpreters, being able to relate to the local people. And so, um, thankfully, we have some great ones that really helped us to establish strong relationships with those. Um, Local you served in Afghanistan. I think you fight the militants and Taliban, Haqqani, however, you know, that Afghanistan, like Paktika is the province, very vulnerable, close to Pakistan and other ones. Um, so now you see the troops withdrawal coming through in the peace talks. What is your initial thoughts? Are you following it? Do you think it's going to help for Afghanistan that troops leave right now? Is it the right time, really? That's a great question. Definitely been following it. Um, it's still Afghanistan is still very close to my heart, and the people there are um, people that live in Afghanistan are survivors. They've unfortunately known war. Um, some of them their entire lives, um, and it's such a difficult situation. At first, when I heard you know peace talks and we're going to withdraw the troops, I was absolutely against it. We shed all this blood and sacrifice and money. We're not you know we, we can't give up. But at the same time, too, we have to draw the line somewhere. Um, but unfortunately, I think that might come at the expense of the Afghanis. Um, I think the government is capable of... Yeah. I, I don't trust um, there to tell you the truth. I'm not involved, uh, so I can only obviously speak from my opinion. Um, I don't. I don't have a lot of trust. I, I I know the way that the Taliban ran the government previously, not allowing you know girls to go to school and hopefully they'll make concessions on that type of stuff. 
But I also understand at the same time, there's a lot of influence from Pakistan. I, I'm, um, I, that's no secret. I'm very familiar and uh, Pakistan has enabled, and this is my opinion, enabled many of the uh, enemy of the coalition forces to continue to fight us. Yeah, and uh, you're, very, you're also an inspiring uh, speaker, leader, so tell me about your experience now and uh, what is it that you're part of like sharing your past experience in Afghanistan and serving in a country like in a war zone? So what yeah. gives you the thing and you bring the message to people like I watch you and what is the message you gave me? Yeah, so I've been able to take my experiences uh, from Afghanistan, from my time in Iraq, um, and be able to center that around the concept of behavioral based leadership. So in the military, it's a very bureaucratic organization. You wear your rank on your uniform every single day. But yet leadership's not a position. It's all about the behaviors. And I think better leaders make a better world. And that's what I want. I'm very purpose-driven. And so I take my experiences, the lessons that I've learned in leadership, and I help share them with others and help them realize their potential, regardless if they're the boss. Because you don't need a boss to be a leader. If I ask you to describe me a good leader, you'd probably say, well, they're a good listener. They're fair, they're accountable, they have empathy, all that great stuff. And that's not exclusive to being the boss. It's mm -hmm. not like you get promoted to being in charge. Now you need to be a good listener. Now you need to be empathetic. Those are skills and behaviors that we can develop right now.